All right. Good morning, everybody. My name is Samantha Mirabal. I'm with Melco's application team, and this is our um, design shop talk. I'm not quite sure if it's streaming. Um, if, if it's working, can someone type in something? Just so I know. Sorry, I'm all I'm on my own over here, so it's hard for me to tell whether it's actually working correctly or not. Maybe? Good morning. All right, Gina, is it working? Can you hear and see me okay? All right. Well, hopefully it is. Well, again, good morning. Again, my name is Samantha, and this, I'm part of the application team with Malco. And today is our design shop talk where we're going to be going over just questions. So the goal of these is really no agenda per se, but just so that you have a place to come and ask questions, um, type them in, and I'll try to keep up to, on them over on the little comment thing on the side. So I did ask online if there were any questions to make sure I'd have something to talk about while people thought of questions to type in. And uh, there was an overwhelming amount of people looking for things on um, uh, lettering and how to make lettering look nice. So from there, what we're going to go over is what I'm going to start, figured I'd start off showing you is where to find a lot of good resources because there's actually a lot of lettering um, details already out there for you to reference. Okay, so I wanted to start there so you'd have a place to look at, um, hey, and so you could reference it later. All right, so if you go to YouTube, and I usually just search for Melco. And when you do that, it will bring up usually the two Melco channels. The one that says education and support is the one that you want to go to for most of the education type videos. Under here, there's playlists, and this is where we upload all these live sessions. So you'll find them all here. Um, there's also the design shot talks that get uploaded as a playlist as well. So you can always reference them later. So if there is a question that was asked and answered and you want to go back and re reference it, you can always get to it there. So under the live sessions, though, I wanted to point these out. There are a whole lot of different videos out here, but there's some videos on how to create lettering. Um, if you go down a bit, Scott, did, Scott and Nate did a really good talk a while back on small lettering. It's about 45 minute um, video and it goes over that in a lot of detail and there's a lot of good tips in there. So I'll leave that one with you. There's also um, a whole bunch of other ones that I'll just put on the screen. And I posted them on one of the Facebook groups. I'll try to post them at, as um, links on this as well. Sorry, I'm copying them over so I can go ahead and do that so you guys have them. Um, let's see. Can I put a comment? There we go. All right, so I'll just, I posted them up in the comment section so that you can reference them. But there's videos, there's a, um, document that's on Melco service that you can reference in there that you'll find not only tips on what needles to use and whatnot um, tie, there's a document on tie-in and tie-off recommendations there, there's a lot of good information out there for you to reference so you've got those links that you can reference later now let's just go ahead and talk about it some since there were so many questions on it I have somewhere right here all right so I've got this presentation I that um, with Scott put together quite a long time ago and I figured I'd quick flip through it so you guys can just see some of the details and we can talk about them and are is this still working it looks like it is good all right so as you can see here this is uh, so out of Scott's and you can see there we've got tiny lettering relative to the dime so tiny lettering is absolutely possible it's really in the digitizing to make sure it sews out right so in this we've got a lot of it's a combination of all the stuff you can find elsewhere so it's you know I highly recommend going and looking at those videos and documents at a later time so you can just see what's you know review it and practice it but it's with the digitizing you can see this is just a quarter inch cube for reference you can get really small and it's how do you do the underlay, what pull compensation, how do you make it look on the screen. And as, as you can see here, some of it looks almost a little bit bulky, but it ends up sewing out nice because, you know, as embroidery sews, you get some shrinkage on it. 
um, different setup tips that you can use. Make sure you're using new needles. You know, if you're starting off with needles that have um, burrs on them or things like that, it's already going to be prone to snagging your thread and ripping it. And when you're doing super small, that's going to cause you more grief. So by having a new needle that's nice and clean, you're at least starting with, at a good point. You want to make sure you're using an appropriate thread length or thread size. You know that your 40 weight thread is what's most commonly used for embroidery. But when you start getting into the really small, that's going to cause more problems because I always liken it to cut drawing with a crayon versus a sharp pencil, right? If I'm trying to write really tiny text with a crayon, um, it's not going to look very clean, right? Because it's too thick. Whereas if I get a really sharpened pencil and try to write small, it's going to be a lot easier to see. So that's the same with the thread. Think about the 40 weight thread being that crayon. It's really thick. So if you're trying to sew really small, it's going to be too big of a line of thread to create it um, nicely. So rather than that, you would go down to a 60 weight thread. 60 weight thread is thinner, all right? So it's going to be thinner. It's going to be a sharper pencil for you to draw with to color in, draw your lines. Um, is the document you're looking at available to print out? Um, I will see about getting it to Melco um, so that you can get it. And they'll usually put it um, as a link for you, all right? Um, so with the 60 weight thread, that's you know thinner. You can of course go to 75 weight thread. That is super small stuff. Um, Madeira makes it. It's really nice. It's very tiny though. Um, but you can do that to get even smaller. If you're using the 75 weight thread, you definitely want to go to the smaller needles and make sure it's reduced in size. But just like when working with 40 weight, you're typically using a 7511 needle. As you go down in size, it's always going to get you crisper to go smaller in needle size because it's going to be smaller holes, more, more refined detail that you can sew. All right. Um, I would say for most applications, going to 60 is probably good enough, but you always have the option to go in even thinner with the 75, all right? So make sure you're using the correct needle size for whatever you're doing. Um, use the smaller thread. The Solvi, small lettering really small, is really narrow columns. So by putting a topper on top of your work, that allows, gives you a nice, um, a material so that as the stitches go through it's not sinking into your fabric all right so you would want to make sure you're using a salvia of some sort you sew on it rip it off it washes off at the end making sure you're using a cutaway tearaway is you know I'm not a big fan of tearaway in general um, I use it only when I have to essentially uh, I find better results from using a cutaway on that same thing is true um, for this right here. So you'd want to make sure you have a nice cutaway to hold the fabric still. If you're dealing with really slippery fabrics using a 505, um, I know we did a video recently on performance wear, so that shows some of the techniques of how to hoop and how to um, get this kind of stretchy moving fabrics to hold still long enough. The other thing is, you know, make sure you're not sewing too fast. When you have fine detail, the machine's not moving, Oh, very much. So by, you know, not running too fast, you're giving it time to not pull all that thread down into the fabric. Um, down here, I did talk about the presets, um, the active feed, increasing that just a little bit. And it's just so that your thread's a little bit, not significantly looser, but a little bit looser so that it's not drawing down so tight. All right. So it's kind of just setting up your machine, making sure you have good threads, good needles, um, appropriate in that. All right. Now, as far as what thread options, now frosted mat, I didn't talk about that one. That is a good option. It is technically, they market it as a 40 weight thread, um, but I find it's actually a little bit thinner. So you can get a more precise, you know, a cleaner looking small lettering from a frosted mat over just using your traditional 40 weight polyester. Um, when you go down to your 60 or 75 weights, it is a thinner thread. It can go down real small. So these are just more on the threads, which I already talked about. So I'm going to skip over that. As far as what to do in your di digitizing, you want to make sure that you're thickening up your text. 
okay, thickening up your columns so that when embroidery shrinks, it's not going so narrow that it you can't see it. So by using some pull offset, what pull offset does is it's an adder, right? You're telling it to, instead of making it thin as my pinky, let's make it as thin, you know, thick as my thumb, whatever. You just are over stitching it a little bit to make it a little bit thicker so that when it shrinks up, it doesn't narrow up as much. Um, if you're using the 40 weight thread, you know, lighten up your density. Um, when you're using the thinner um, threads, you actually decrease it some, so depending on what type of thread. But overall, what you want to think about is minimizing the number of needle penetrations that go in a small area. Because if you're going to try to, you know, stab, you know, an eighth inch type letter, and you're sewing back and forth, scribbling, you know, with your crayon, it's going to look um, cluttered, bulky, and it's not going to look very crisp. Whereas if you lighten up some of that, you can get a cleaner look with your final sew outs. Okay. Um, capital letters, you know, it's already difficult doing small. So staying with capitals is a trick to help out and making sure that you're digitizing for it. I, give, I have an example here just of this so you can see some of the settings. This is using just a basic font within um, Design Shop. Okay, so it's the industry script that you can see here. And these are just the settings. So we'll, I'll get this posted so you can see it. But as you can see, you know, it's 0.15 in size. Can I make this bigger? Let's see. View. There's a way somewhere. There it is, full screen mode. Okay, maybe that'll be a little bit better. All right, so you can see it's 0.15 inch text, so it's rather small. And from there, using this is done using 60 weight thread, so it's got a slightly lower density. Um, but you can see the knots that uses pull offset. That's making them wider here, so that when the columns sew out, it's nice and legible. Making sure you're using knots and using a center walk underlay. <clears throat> The stitch length you can see is a little bit smaller. That's if you think, why do you have to do that? Well, if I'm going to try to draw a circle and I have it set at 20 point stitch length, you know, that's going to, for a small area, that might actually draw a diamond, right? Because it's each of the stitches are rather long. So by reducing the stitch length, you can get actually a better approximation to the curves so that you're less risk of having that underlay hang out you know, outside of the top stitching, so it actually gets covered up appropriately. Um, it's always, you know, digitizing letters from scratch when you're dealing with the small stuff is usually the better way to go, um, you know, and rather than just modifying fonts, although there are fonts specifically digitized for small, so those are great to use. But here are just some little tips that you can work with, you know, in general, the holes on your letters, you know, RP, B, those sorts of things. I have. You want to make them a little larger than usual so you don't end up closing them up. Um, make sure you're using your, making sure your openings are staying at least a millimeter. Again, that's just so that you end up with a gap so that you do, it's not closed up and looking like a big blob. It actually is looking like a definable letter. Okay. Um, just scanning real quick, see if there's anyone's posted questions. I don't see anything yet, so I'm going to keep on going. All right, so there's all of these that you can reference, but another, most of this I think I've already talked about. Yeah, so when you're going to the thinner threads, you're gonna decrease your densities. Um, the pull offset makes it wider so that as it, the embroidery shrinks, it actually ends up not shrinking so thin that it's not recognizable. Yeah, we talked about all those. Underlay is extremely important for embroidery as a general rule, you know, it's, Always, you want something to hold your stabilizer and your fabric stable because if it's not held and it doesn't give you that foundation of thread to, that the top stitching goes over, what's going to happen? Things move around, embroidery shrinks, and you get less than perfect results, right? So by making sure you have underlay, you're putting down that first kind of prime coat. I mean, think about painting drywall, right? If you're not going to just go grab your expensive top coat paint and slap it on the drywall. It's going to suck into it. You're going to have to put a lot, invest a lot more into painting it over a second time. Well, with embroidery, that under, that base, that primer is our underlay. That's going to hold it still, give us a row of thread on top of what we're working on so that when the top stitching comes over, it doesn't sink in to the fabric, okay, it stays. It also holds your lettering together, gives you that foundation layer of stitches, and you know stops it from sinking in. So it's very important, not only in small lettering, but whatever you're doing to make sure you have underlay. Um, 
in general, auto under, you know, it's better to avoid auto underlay if you can. Um, someone just asked, should you use the auto underlay? It works. Um, I use it a lot, but when I go super small, it's always better to do it yourself because you can control where the needle penetrations go. Um, do it as a walk normal rather than using that, and you can kind of specify it to make sure it's all held together appropriately. You can think about your pathing. You know, what order are you going to sew in to go from one spot to the other? And you plan it out so you get an efficient sew out. Okay. Another thing is, as I said before, is reducing that stitch length. And that's just so that you get a better approximation to the small shape. And then using your style one tie offs. The style one tie offs are in line with your sewing. So if you use a style five, that puts a big old X. Well, on small lettering, that big X ends up looking like strange dots all over the text. Okay, so I'd stay with a style one when you're dealing with small. This is just an example of how you think about it from developing your path. So to create this letter, if we we're doing it from scratch, right? So first we have to digitize um, our underlay. So we would start here and we'd draw just our center walk. It's thicker here, so that's why it's spread out. So it's a, essentially a center walk or an edge walk through here. And that's going to hold the fabric and stabilizer together. It's going to give me that foundation of stitching. So I started where the green circle is, ended here. Well, that's just to set me up for the column that we do next, right? So the column is a series of stitches running side to side. It covers that up, and it forms the start of my S. When we end here, that's where the ending point is. That's where my next element starts. So now we're going to run around, do our column stitches around the S, ending here start and end. So pathing is another just thing that you get better at it the more you do it, but really thinking about where your starts and stops are, that's going to set you up to have your machine sew efficiently so that as the sew out's going, it's not doing trims in the middle of a letter, moving to another spot and trimming it. That's just a waste of time and it ends up with a, um, you know, a less clean um, file. Now, I know some people ask me, well, does it really matter if I save five trims? You know, I say a, save a minute of sew time by not thinking about my pathing. Well, okay, you're making one. No, probably not. But if I'm doing production run and I have a thousand shirts to make and I can take a minute out of my sew time by paying attention to how I digitize it, well, that's a thousand minutes of sew time that we've avoided. That's real time and money. So it's... I always say get in the habit of thinking about it up front. It just, in the end, you'll be more, it'll set you up for success by really thinking about that path, those connections, and how you move from one spot to another in a design. Now, when you're looking at small lettering, the other thing you think about is not only, you know, this, but if I have to go to the next letter, right, how do we do that? Do we trim it, move to the next spot, and sew? Well, if we're already working in, you know, eighth inch type things, there's different techniques you can use to like bury a stitch through here so that you don't have to trim it, you just keep sewing. So you can put a manual stitch between two things so that it buries that thread in into the fabric so that instead of just doing a jump stitch, which would be small enough, that you can get over here and to, you know, you're not going to notice it. But if you add like a manual stitch in there, that's just a technique you can use to help bury them, to make them a little less visible. Okay. Um, also kind of think outside of the box when you're looking at columns like this. Normally when you're dealing with big letters, right, you do your crossbar of your A up and down. Well, when you go really narrow, that column's going to be what? just a few point, you know, a handful of points wide. So going up and down is not really setting yourself up for success. Whereas if you go side to side, you can cover it up and it will look clean and reduce the needle number of needle penetrations. It gives you a longer stitch length. So it just works out better. Okay. Um, you know, just these are all in that file, in the document file there. So you can review them later, but it's just different columns and how you should sew them out. Um, when you're dealing with eyes and small dots, you'll get it cleaner as a, if you sew it as a star rather than side to side. And plus, it's fewer stitches. A good design you can look at and sew, if you've never seen that effect before, is the oneday.ofm in Design Shop. Or uh, most of your trainers, when they show up, will sew that at some point. But I'll show you where it is. If you go... In design shop file open go to 
your C drive designs right here that installs with the software. So if you look at that, um, the eyeball is a star. See that? So that's just one where you can see the effect by something really small sews out with minimal stitches and it looks really clean. Okay, so it's just one spot you can see that. Oops. All right. What else do we have? Full screen. Okay. You know, materials, we talked about all this, so this is just kind of wrapping it all up. Minimize, eliminate trims. That is trims between letters. I guess I didn't specifically talk about why that's not necessarily the best. Let's just pretend these are two letters next to each other. If I trim right here, jump over, and, you know, that's what, I don't know, something really small. Less, you know, well less than eighth of an inch, maybe .05 inches, something very small. And it's going to move over, do another tie-in stitch because you want to tie it in, and it's going to start sewing this letter. What that does, you know, it does a trim. It's going to leave your top thread and your bobbin kind of down into here. And when it moves, it doesn't have enough movement between the letters to clear out that thread from the hook. So you're just setting yourself up for more complications, whereas if you drag the, you know, do a jump stitch as you go around, um, dragging that thread, one, you'll sew faster, you'll keep your machine at high speed, running more efficient longer, and you'll just get a cleaner sew out. Okay? You know, every stitch does count, particularly when you're doing in the small areas, so pay attention to the underlay, and that's why doing it manually is often a little bit better. Okay? Uh, Small lettering is absolutely possible, um, as you can see in some of the pictures we have here. Those two Melco designs that you saw, I'll go back to them just so you can see them again. might not have noticed them. Uh, right here. That's a 60 weight. That's a 75 weight. And there, those are actual sew outs with thread. If you look at this last picture, that shows you what the files look like digitally. So, I mean, you can do really nice sewing. It's just a matter of paying attention to your settings. Okay, so that was, there. like I said, there are a lot of good resources. Um, I know Scott did an entire video on YouTube that you can go look at. This one, the small lettering, it's 45, 46 minutes, and it covers a lot of great material. Um, the FAQ, if you go look at that one, so I did post that link. But it's got, again, more tips and tricks to think about. And down here is another document that's got a whole more write-ups on things to consider and think about. It's a, doc, a document there. Um, the types of tie-offs in the settings for it. Again, I posted that link on the comment already, but you can review those. And this is really, you know, based on the size of what you're working on, what settings to consider and what to use. Okay. Uh, Let's see. Any questions on that before I hop on to what else people asked? I don't see anything typed in yet. Hopefully it's still coming through. Okay, so other things that people asked about was pull compensation. Um, why use pull comp versus offset? Um, and, oh, real quick before I forget it, someone asked about the notes icon. So they said, hey, I type in stuff here and that I... You know, how do I know when I open a file if I have notes saved on there? Well, right here you can see there's an M and there's this little paper. That paper it only appears right there when there's a note saved on the file. So if you see that little paper there, that means there's something in the notes field. Now, if you're not familiar with the no notes field, what is this good for? Well, you can type in whatever you want in here. It's particularly handy when you're working with... Um, a shop where you have operators running things, um, or if you're paperless, I like it for that reason alone. Um, and here I'll add what you know, what stabilers, stabilizers I used, what blank, um, anything I want, what colors I used. You know, this is the 1971. That's the 1748. That's you know 1988. Whatever colors and threads I ended up using for my customer sew out, I type that all in here so that when they call me a year from now and say, Hey, can you make me three more of the shirts? Same thing. 
I'm not going, hmm, okay, what did I use? Um, it's all typed in there, so I can reference it, just pull up their file. Um, if you have operators, it's also convenient. You can not only pass on that same information to them, so they thread the machines right, but you can also put, you know, what quantities you want, um, anything you want your operators to know, and you can put there and show when they go to the OS, they can click on the little notes icon and see whatever notes you've left for them. So it's pretty handy. Okay. Um, is attaching fonts as digitized better or would closest point be better? Um, depends. If you're trying to minimize the trims, so what that question is referring to is if you look at fonts right down here, so let's say I type in Samantha. I'm going to go into the properties and down here the connection type. So what that connection is asking is where does one letter start and where does the next letter end? And it's how how are those points selected? Well, if you leave it as digitized, it's whoever digitized this font, the green circle is where they wanted that letter to start, the red X is where they thought best for that letter to end to set it up for the majority of the following letters. Um, that's what as digitized is. I tend to use closest point quite a lot. That rearranges all your starts and stops so that you're increasing your chances of being able to avoid trims between letters. Um, and by avoiding trims, you get faster so else. Now, when you use closest point, the only thing I would say is the default on your tie-in and tie-offs for the software is usually 64. Um, and that is what that's telling you is if this jump stitch from one to the next letter is 64 points or longer, it's going to leave or shorter, excuse me, 64 points or shorter, it's going to leave that thread and just keep on sewing. Well, 64 points is nearly a quarter inch. That's a really long piece of thread. That's going to have me going and finding my little embroidery scissors and trimming all out those jump stitches, which makes me crazy. I'd rather the machine do that for me. So I would say, you know, 20 points is a really small line. So in general, if it's 20 points or less, no one's going to notice it. So I tend to set it at 20. I know there's others I've heard recommend 30 as kind of the that toggle point between what's acceptable or not. Um, it's really a personal preference. I don't like jumps that I don't like those connectors between letters. So unless they're really small, which is why I usually go with Tony. Okay. So it's a personal preference. Um, I like using closest point just for that reason to get, you know, kind of optimize my starts and stops so that I'm minimizing that the chance of having to have a trim. All right. Um, let's see. So that's a, that was a question before we did that. What were we talking about? Oh, full compensation. All right, so any other questions? None yet. All right, so let's go look at pull compensation. So pull compensation can be done in by offset right here or by percent. And some of the easiest ways to see these effects of what the individual ones do is to draw a square or a triangle or something. So I'm going to draw a quick triangle. Give it a start point, a stop point, and a stitch direction. All right, so now I've got a triangle here. Okay, so if I do a pull compensation, you can see, let's flip it over, make it a pyramid. All right, so I've got a triangle here. Now, if I change this to 150, look what it did to my shape. It's no longer looking like this triangle, and that's because pull comp by percentage is multiplication based. It looks at the length from one side of your wireframe to the other, and it's going to multiply whatever percentage, and that's how much it's going to overstitch. So it's overstitching 50%. So it's going to, this is a long distance, so it's going to overstitch by a longer amount. Then up here, it's really small from corner to corner, so it barely overstitches at all. So by using pull by percent, you can actually start introducing distortions into designs. So I don't use by um, percentage-based pull compensation hardly ever. I don't believe Nate does either. I don't know about Scott, um, what his preference is. But in general, I almost exclusively use pull offset because it's uniform. It's an adder. You're just telling it how much larger to make the shape, how much further to overstitch by. So if I just... That I don't recommend 10 as a number. I'm just doing it to be excessive so you can easily see it. So 
if you look down here, what that did, the wireframe, that's my blue, that's the shape I drew. By using pull offset, you're telling it to overstitch by that amount. Okay, so that's just, it's making it a little bit bigger so that when the embroidery narrows up just as part of, you know, how embroidery is done, you still get a nice bold shape. Um, if you've ever had shapes that you sew out, like let's say you sew a circle and it, you fill it all in and then you could do a border around it and they don't line up. You notice that the circle is more of an egg shaped and then you get gaps between that border. That's because the embroidery is shrinking. So fix that using your underlay and um, pull offset, pull compensation, you know, fix the digitizing with it to make sure you are minimizing its ability to move, but then no, it's going to shrink a little bit. So then add some pull offset to compensate for that. Okay. Um, what offset would I suggest? You know, when you're dealing with super small things, one, maybe two point, but typically one's enough because it's, when you're dealing with really small, one is a large percentage of making it wider. So I would do maybe one point, you know, I, personally, I like things to be a lot bolder. So I tend to go as high as three points. When it starts going over three points, it's excessive. You might as well just make the shape bigger rather than continuing to mess with the offset. So, you know, I put one point of offset on nearly everything I do as a standard practice. Okay. Um, there was a question about Bravo differences. Uh, I'm not by any means an expert on the Bravos, um, but basically the Bravos have three packages. Um, they're, but I think the question was, what's the difference between Bravo and EMT16s or the other machines, the XTSs? Bravos have a, they're software limited versions essentially. So if you look at them they don't have settings by color they don't have um, the full sew field depending on what package you have they sew they have a max sew speed of what 1100 i believe for a package c a thousand for the other two packages whereas your emt 16 pluses will sew up to 1500 stitches a minute um there's it's all software type based stuff so you know, the c package will give you the same sew field that the mt16 plus does so then it's really just the different settings. You know, the MT-16 will make doing puff a little bit easier because now you have the puff button, whereas on Bravo, you have to know what the settings are and stop and adjust those manually. Um, there's the setting by color, setting by needle. All of that is available in your EMT-16s or XTSs, you know, that series, the Melco series versus the Bravo. But there, I know I've seen um, a list where they kind of give you the high level overview of the different machines. And I believe the Bravo program controls that list. I, I don't know. I'll just try to find it and see if it can be made um, available. Like I said it's, I've seen it once, and I know it's out there somewhere. What other questions do we have? I don't see any others typed. Anything else I can help with today? I'll wait a little bit. Oh. While I wait to see if anyone else is going to add questions, um, there was a question. I think um, Linda, and I forget who else, there was two folks who were asking about how to update um, Design Shop. So you can, of course, go into one of these things. Let's see. Check for updates. So there's one. So tools, check for updates, and that will look for it. Um, depending on what version you have, you might need to um, call directly to Melco and get them to send you a link because this works in the newer versions, but some of the older versions, um, I don't believe, I forget what version that actually turns on to being working. So that I don't remember, but it does work. I know recently they pushed an update. So when I shut down Design Shop and reopened it, it popped up automatically saying, hey, update available. Now, if that's not working for you, you can always call Melco. Um, or if you want a disk sent to you, I know someone said their internet is atrocious and they don't want to wait 900 minutes for something to just time out during the da download. Um, you can call Melco, the parts department, um, or email customercare at melco.com. And they do sell the disks. I don't know what they sell them for. You'd have to look there. But if you email and ask, they'll tell you what it costs and how to purchase it and you can actually have the latest update sent to you to install from disk 
All right. Ooh, it looks like someone typed something. How to replay. Oh, I'm glad. So um, for t these videos will be processed. They do automatically go back up on Melco's Facebook page um, afterwards. I don't know if it'll be this week or maybe next week. Um, they get uploaded onto YouTube. And if you forgot where that is, if you do a search for um, Melco, I'll just do it again. <clears throat> so if you go to YouTube, search for Melco. And I don't want to listen to that. Right here, this Melco Education and Support, click on that one, and you'll see there's playlists. So under Playlists, down here are the Design Shop Talks Q&A. So that's where they'll all get posted. Um, there's also all the live sessions. So if you have not looked at them, there are a lot. We're, you know, there's 43 of them out there. Plus, if you haven't watched the new videos for Design Shop um, V10, Nate the guys did a great job of putting together just an overview on how to use the software. So you'd have the digitizing basics, which kind of go through working with other people's files, just how to navigate through, how to add text, how to address properties, um, what do those properties do, those sorts of things. Um, and then there's the digitizing class. That's not under basics. That's under, where are they? There, object property, DS basics, object properties, and editing. That's where you'll find all kind of working with other people's stuff. Whereas the digitizing basics, that's where you learn how to use your columns, your fills, um, your walk input, talks about the, diff the digitizing process in general, and it'll get you started. So then, you know, I highly recommend looking at those. And of course, you can always look at the live sessions. Um, a lot of good information is covered there on how to do different techniques, um, not only with the machine, but also with your digitizing, how to split things up, everything. All right. What other questions do we have? Let's see. I don't see any others typed. All right. Well, um, I will send over the PDF to Melco and see if they can upload it so you guys can have that um, to reference along with the other resources, which I already put a link as a comment on this video itself. So I hope this was helpful. Again, think of your questions. We're trying to do them usually on a weekly basis, if not a few times a month at least, these design shop talks. And we don't come with an agenda, so if you don't ask questions, eventually we'll um, talk for a little bit and then get off. So um, just come with your questions. We'll see what we can do to get them answered. All right. Well, you guys have a great afternoon. Um, again, my name is Samantha. I'm with the application team in Melco. All right. You guys have a great afternoon. Bye.